Welcome to Biology Minds. Today we're going to talk about forensics, specifically the crime scene. Now the crime scene and the lab, they go hand in hand. You need people to collect the specimens properly in order to bring them back to the lab and to analyze them properly. So a big part of the crime scene is really the practitioners and who works for the crime lab that's able to collect the evidence and properly analyze that evidence. So the most important thing for the crime lab is physical evidence and what really co it comes down to is how well was that evidence collected. Collectors of physical evidence must have an understanding of the crime lab's techniques, capabilities, and limitations. Now we see that as practitioners go out there and they start to explore forensic science, they start to see that they're very limited and that's why we try to collect as much evidence as possible so that we can put everything together to really make a case for uh, prosecuting a, a specific suspect. Uh, so the investigators must recognize physical evidence. Now uh, forensic scientists and uh, evidence collectors, they're all trained but it's really up to them to get a better understanding of what they need to collect. Every crime scene is different. So a good evidence collector, it's not that they had a better education or better schooling or better training than another one. It's just that they had that intuition or they can walk into a scene and they have better insight than others. So the practitioners and the uh, evidence collectors really play a major role in how well uh, a suspect is going to be prosecuted and, and how the evidence is going to be collected and analyzed. You want to preserve uh, any, any property um, or any uh, evidence that's collected. Um, in order to preserve certain things, you need to know what's the best way to preserve it. Most things that we think of are going to be in an airtight container, anything from arson. All right, it's damaged enough, it's been burned. Um, it, you want to put that in like a metal container so that it can be analyzed and we can preserve it as much as we can. Anything that's blood stained, on the other hand, we want to protect that from mold. So we don't want to keep it all... Uh, in, in an airtight container, we want it to be rather airy. So you're going to put that into a brown paper bag. All right, so keep that in mind. Uh, obviously, you must be properly trained. I've talked about this in class previously. Um, there are in bigger areas, you go to New York City, they're going to have specific evidence collectors and they're going to have a whole. Uh, crime scene unit that's going to come down and they're going to assess everything and really preserve everything and send everything to the lab and someone at the lab is going to do something. In smaller areas like town of Newburgh, city of Newburgh, New Windsor, they're going to have their detectors or their investigators really collect all the evidence and then they're just going to ship it up to Albany. So it depends on the situation. Now these uh, investigators and these detectives, they're trained but once again, it really depends on what kind of insight they have or, or their ability to go into a, a crime scene and really pick up on uh, any remnants or of trace evidence and properly uh, bagging it or preserving it, collecting it, and sending it to Albany. So a major thing that you have to remember when you get to the crime scene, all right, if you're a police officer or you're a detective and you get to a crime scene, you want to first make sure that you seek medical assistance for anyone that's there. Okay, If someone's about to die, that doesn't mean, oh yeah, they're a goner, let them go. No, you have to call EMS, you call the ambulance, you have them come. Okay, It's also a good idea, even if the person is dead at that point, have them come. You're going to have them come and ultimately they're going to pronounce them dead and you know say that you can go on further with your investigation at that point um you should have already secured the scene so not that it's simultaneously but you're going to call for medical assistance you're going to call for ems and then you're going to secure the scene so you should be kind of doing this somewhat simultaneously first obviously 
first priority if someone is there bleeding out you need to contact uh, some medical assistance and then you need to secure the scene okay a lot of times there's always nosy people people trying to you know rubber neckers people that are trying to see what's going on what's happening so you'd be surprised how many people really can ruin a crime scene by just being nosy so you want to secure the scene you also don't want anyone coming in and tampering with evidence um, there's been cases where someone commits a crime and then their friend comes in and decides to try to mess with things alter evidence move evidence get rid of evidence so you really want to secure that scene anybody that's still there that's a suspect okay you want to uh, arrest them okay you're going to rope off things, barricade things. You're going to position guards in certain areas. Make sure that if it's if you're indoors, all right, you're covering all your exits and your entrances. If it's outdoors, it's a little bit more difficult. That's where you have to set up barricades, and hopefully you have enough personnel, you have enough police officers where you can put them strategically at different places for them to really uh, cut off anyone that's going to try to come in or leave. Uh once again, avoid unauthorized personnel or any, you know, people involved with uh, the news and family and friends. Once again, you'd be surprised how many family members want to come in and touch the body or look at the. You got to keep them out. They'll have their time to kind of say goodbye, I guess. Um, but when you're trying to maintain your crime scene, that is not the right time. So once you've done that, you want to make sure that you're properly recording the cr the crime scene. Okay, there's three things that you always want to remember. You want sketches, you want photos, and you want notes. All right, students often forget about notes, note taking. All right, that's just as important as the sketches and the photographs. So those are three things that you definitely want to remember: sketches photos and note taking okay now the photos you want to remember from doing our sketches all right in our sketches we need these little triangles or you could call them cones all right ultimately they're supposed to be arrows showing us which way that the camera took the shot all right so obviously that was the arrow going that way okay if you see something like this all right, then the angle was this way, the photo was shot. And whenever you do a sketch, there should be uh, these angles that show you, all right, we took a picture going this way, we took a picture going this way, we took a picture going this way. And then when you go back and you look at your photos, you should be able to correspond, okay, well, this is the photo of this angle and this is the photo of this angle. And um, your photos, you need to uh, make sure that you're keeping them organized. Anything that's evidence, you're going to take two photos. All right, you're going to have one of the close-up. You should do that directly above it. All right, we say that it's at a 90-degree angle, so we're looking right down on that evidence and we're getting a good view of it. And you also want one, a picture that shows you uh, where it is, how it fits into that actual crime scene. Where was it? Okay. Now, in the past. We've said that you really need to make sure that you're uh, taking excellent photos and they're clear, they're not blurry, but digital photography has really changed that because now we have a little screen on our on our camera and we look at it and we go, oh, that didn't come out too good, and we take another one. So, you know, there's not that much of a problem with that anymore, but you do want to make sure that you're taking a good photo or two, okay, in order so that when you go back to the lab and you start putting things together for the district attorney that you're not going oh shoot how do i now go back and take this photo again you can't take the photo again so you want to do the best you can so that when you go back and it comes up in court the people in court or the jury don't go what what are we looking at we can't see this this isn't helpful we can't use this so um once again photographs any sketches, note taking, it's all based on the crime scene in this unaltered condition. Okay, and that 
plays a major role in what you're going to do. Obviously, it might be altered if someone was hurt and they were rolling around and they were messing with your crime scene. But other than that, you want it to be as unaltered as possible. Um, what else about photography? So photography ultimately is going to, we say photography is going to record. report and it's going to relate okay we're going to be able to relate where it was opposed to or compared to other evidence so we need it to record report and to relate rough sketches you're going to have your a b line that we can use as a reference point to show us where the body is um, and we can really make all our measurements from this original AB line. In your rough sketch, you're going to have all your little measurements. And then when we uh, move on to our smooth sketch, we're going to, you know, get rid of the measurements because it's all going to be to scale. Remember, like I said, we want our arrows put in for photography. You're going to always want a compass, okay, showing north and south. Any time is going to be in military time. Okay. Um, you want to indicate any entrances, exits, windows, furniture. Everything should be as much to scale as possible. Okay. We also can use the symbol right here to show us which way the door opens and closes. So an example of a rough sketch where you have every little measurement put in, our couch measurement, okay? And then when you move on to your smooth sketch, you're not you're going to get rid of that because it's going to be too scale. And somewhere it should say, hey, this is what our scale is, right? You're, you're going to have your legend, okay? So you don't have to write in, oh, right here, this is a shell casing. We just put a letter D and then we go down and we say, oh, that's the location of the shell casing. Now, if we have a lot of bullet holes everywhere, then we can't do this two dimensional sketch. We have to ultimately do a 3D sketch to show us where, how high in the wall did the bullet go through, uh, where did it enter, where did it ex exit. All right, so 3D sketch, for gunshots, I'll say. It's another comparison. So crime scene notes, right? They're written notes, or they can be audio recorded, but we still call them uh, crime scene notes, or we still call it note taking. All right, and it's gonna be detailed information about the scene. And this is very important because a lot of times uh, people, detectives, even, you know, students always say, oh, I'll, I'll just remember. You really don't remember as much as you think you remember, especially if for a detective, they're going to start doing a lot more cases and it all starts to blur together. And, you know, just as well as I know that, you know, one day you remember something and then suddenly the next day it gets blurry and court cases can go on for years and years and they're going to call upon you as a detective to testify and suddenly things are a little bit blurry to you so you want excellent note taking so if you are asked a question or you need to now go back two years later because you're going to testify and you don't really remember what the whole case was about or what you found or what was significant you can go back to your notes and say oh that's right uh this is what happened and i said this was happening i remember that this was this certain way, and I noticed this other thing. Okay, now these are different ways to ultimately um, search a scene. Okay, if you're going to search a scene, you can do this uh, strip search, okay, or a line search. And it's good, you use two people, all right, one person goes right. One person goes right here, one person goes right here, and you kind of can walk together and search through. All right, and the other person is going to do the same thing. 
All right, that's good for two people. Even this, you can do this with two people, or this might be helpful with one person. All right, and you're gonna slowly go through. All right, and you end up going through everything in the scene. Okay, but the best thing for if you only have one person is a spiral search. Now with a spiral search, okay, and with all these searches, you see that you start on the outside, right? You never really want to, you never want to start on the inside because then suddenly you're contaminating your scene and you're dragging it outwards. Okay, so you want to start on the outside and then you want to work your way in. Okay, so if you're by yourself, spiral search is, is a good idea. But you always want to start on the outside and then work your way in. You don't want to start in the middle and then suddenly you're dragging blood and soil samples and whatever else outward. Okay, these are good for if you're doing large searches. We looked at that documentary, Making a Murderer, and we saw that they had to do these massive searches of this junkyard. Okay, so they they could set up quadrants or they did rows of cars. And, you know, Susie took this row, and Jason took this row, and Raymond took this row, and Lucy took this row, and they went along. So for outside, for larger things, you're going to do maybe a quadrant, or you can really uh, do a, a ray search or a wheel search where, you know, you all start somewhere. And, all right, let's now look for any evidence that we can find. So when you when you start collecting evidence, right? We call this physical evidence. Obviously, it's not uh, a witness's account of anything. It's physical evidence that we can send back to the lab, or we can take pictures of, and we can use it in the court case. So you're going to want to take the victim's clothing, all right? Any fingernail scrapings, um, hair is a big one. So you can take hair off of. The couch and take care off of the victim and maybe take care from a suspect and it's good to have extra samples because they can be your control samples so even if you know all right this person has nothing to do with it um but they were a friend that was at the scene you could take these samples and just use it as a comparison i know this is this person's hair i'm going to make sure that uh you know, it's a, something to compare to the other hair that we have. Uh, we also use reference samples in the lab. And these samples are excellent because they make sure that we can calibrate our equipment. Okay, and really they're there for comparison. You also want to collect any blood, like I said. If you're going to package any clothing that has blood on it, you want it to be airy so that it doesn't uh, get moldy. Bullets recovered from the body, uh, hand swabs for gunshot residue, any vaginal, anal, oral swabs, and any sex-related crimes. Uh, collecting and packaging evidence, like I said, you also want to remember any trace evidence, you're going to want to use a druggist fold, okay, so that you don't lose any of it. If you only have a little bit of powder or a little bit of hair or a little bit of uh, soil, you want to make sure that you can uh, hold on to all that, so you're going to use your druggist fold, okay, so that we don't, none of it falls out. Clothing should be dried and placed in paper bags once again. Um, chain of custody is very important. It's a, a way that we're making sure that there's someone's always responsible for the evidence. Okay, so you're not getting evidence and then, you know what, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to leave it, uh, you know, unattended or I'm going to give it to my cousin Fred and he's going to maybe watch it. No, it's always going to be handed off to another uh, official, another police officer, or it's going to be handed off to the evidence uh, container, that person that handles all the evidence at the precinct. But it's never going to be unattended. It's never. It's not going to sit in someone's uh, police car trunk for three months, and then you go, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it should be good still. All right, so chain of custody is very important, and you're just you're documenting who has it when, and it's always, uh, be, whenever it's passed off, you're making sure that the next person understands that they are now responsible for this evidence, okay? People must, you know, write the time that they got it, the day that they got it, military time, and um, you're going to write your initials and your name and everything's going to be documented. And it's going to say, uh, Officer Fred handed it off to Officer Susie, and Officer Susie handed it off to Officer Mike. And so on and so forth. Substrate control. We talked about you want your control samples. Okay, so maybe take it from a third party that was at the scene just so you can use it as, as a reference. It's all about comparison. Okay. Fourth Amendment, you're going to want to know that in these uh, cases, okay, Mincy versus Arizona, right? <clears throat> Tyler versus Michigan, you're going to want to know that the major part of these were was the, the Fourth Amendment, okay? Um, so uh, justification for a warrantless search, this is going to be on your exam. You're going to want to know all four of these, all right? So there are emergency circumstances. Someone is screaming bloody murder and they're getting murdered. That's an emergency circumstance that a police officer can now go into a residence even though they don't currently have a warrant, okay? Also, to prevent destruction of evidence, if you know for a fact that something happened and there's evidence and they're going to get rid of that evidence, you can go in without a warrant. Uh, searching a person or property within the immediate control of the person which led to a lawful arrest, so oftentimes uh, a cop sees someone doing some kind of illegal drug, and then when they run up to them, they put it away. Well, now, since they saw them do it, they can, uh, you know, search the person without a warrant, search their car without a warrant, and that's because it's ultimately definitely going to lead to a lawful arrest, right? It's not, they're not planting anything, it's, they're, they know that something happened, they're going to search their property, if they're going to find something, and then they can arrest that person without the judge saying that it was, uh, they had no warrant or it was an unlawful arrest. And then also if the person gives consent. So a lot of times, I know teenagers are always saying, oh, they asked if I could search my car and I just said yes because... Uh, I figured I would just look guilty if I didn't let them. Well, you're giving them consent. So you, after that, you can't really be upset that they didn't have a warrant or you didn't feel like they had a reason to search. They asked you if they could search. You said yes, and that was their consent to search. So if they found something after that point, all right, maybe it's on you. I understand you you know, you know, don't want to fight with a cop same way, um, but that's you're giving them consent. So you can't, after the fact, say, well, they didn't even have a warrant. There was no reason for them to search me. Well, they asked and you said, okay. Like I said, you're going to want to know Mincy versus Arizona, all right, and as well as Michigan versus Tyler, all about the Fourth Amendment. Fourth Amendment is there to protect us. Modus operandi, um, operandi. It's all about the way that someone does something. So we looked at that article that was about the modus operandi of the expert witness, right? The way that they should act. Okay, you can use that for a number of, of uh, different things to compare it to. But ultimately, when they say modus operandi, that means that it's the way that the killer or the burglar does their thing. In Home Alone, they call themselves the the wet bandits. Right? Every time they, they turn all the faucets on and then they flood the houses. And then in another Home Alone, they call themselves the sticky bandits because he wraps his hand in tape or something and he steals stuff that way. Um, <clears throat> if a serial killer always tends to kill Asian men with a machete, well, that's his or her modus operandi. That's the way or the style that they commit a crime. So if you hear that Latin term, modus operandi, that's all they're referring to, right? And, but, you know, just because now suddenly another Asian guy was killed with a machete doesn't mean that it was definitely that person because there's always copycats. 
and uh, you know, just flukes. Um, so we went over this, okay. Personnel that can apply for a warrant, any police officer, uh, district attorney, public servant. Uh, the court, or more specifically, the judge is going to issue a warrant. You have to serve that warrant within 10 days. Okay, uh, the warrant allows searches involving, you know, designated property and premises, vehicles, or designated people. So it's going to specify who is going to get searched or what is going to get searched and what they're ultimately looking for. It's not just going to say, yeah, uh, anything involving Mr. Mayor, you can search everything. So then they can go to my third grade teacher's house and look through her stuff. doesn't work like that. All right, you have to say we're going to look through Mr. Mayor's house and we're going to look through uh, Mr. Mayor's car and his wife's car and so on and so forth. Once again, Fourth Amendment. Probable cause is another thing. Now, get, there's somewhat of a gray area because it's your word versus, uh, uh, against the police officer's word. So what exactly is probable cause? They're going to say they have probable cause. You might feel like they didn't. Okay, but ultimately, if you were committing a crime and they arrested you, then it suddenly becomes lawful. Okay, so... That's a little bit of a gray area, but they tend to uh, want a want to have a warrant if they're going to make a major arrest, and they easily can get a warrant from a judge if they are going after a legitimate criminal. So types of courts that can issue warrants: criminal court, district court, circuit court, supreme court, all the way up to supreme court. All right. So remember, jurisdiction is a thing is uh, very important. You're not going to get <clears throat> a warrant uh, in Michigan to search your house in New York. Um, you also need, it has to be issued to officers um, or the district attorney of that specific area. You're not going to give a warrant to police in California from the judge in Michigan to search the house in Connecticut. Okay, so jurisdiction plays a major part in this as well. Time restraints, it has to be uh, within 10 days between issuance, okay? Uh, so once they get it, they have 10 days to serve, serve and they can't, it, a warrant doesn't mean that, okay, now you can do whatever you want and look through this person's house whenever you want till the end of time. It's typically uh, between 6 a.m. and 9 at night or 2100 hour. Uh, but there are some circumstances where the police are going to change those times. They're going to be specific to the judge and say, look, these people maybe sell drugs, uh, <clears throat> between these times and they're very aware. And whenever a police officer drives down the, down the street, they do a hand signal or some bird call or something and they get rid of all the drugs and we can never really do anything. But if we hit them at three in the morning, they'll be asleep. They all the people that are hustling drugs are asleep at that time. There's no one out. And that's when we could hit them the hardest. Well, then the judge is going to grant them that that uh, that warrant that has those specifications. OK, so but it has to say it on the warrant that you can you now are using other times or you're going to have um, an extension, meaning, okay, typically we do 10 days after inch issuance, but we're going to do 15 days because the, the police want to time it perfectly and they might not get the best time within 10 days. So um, on the application, you're going to see uh, the court that they're applying to, the judge, uh, name of officer that or DA that's requesting the warrant, specific location to be searched. And then you know, everything else about what evidence you think you're going to find or what evidence you're looking for, what premises or what vehicle you're trying to look through, and so on and so forth. Um, so if the officer is denied access for the search, then do not uh, have to give notice of entry. All right. So, you know, they will sometimes knock on the door, they'll show them the warrant, people slam the door in the face, well now they can enter the home 
regardless if you're trying to let them in or not, okay? Uh, that's what the warrant is all about. They can search it whether you like it or not. If the location is unoccupied, that doesn't mean, all right, now we got to wait till they're home. Nope, they can go right in and they can search the premises. Uh, must make a reasonable effort to show ID and warrant. Now, that's also another gray area. What's a reasonable effort? But, you know, typically, unless they think you're going to try to hide evidence or something, they're going to knock on your door. They're going to say, look, I'm officer so-and-so. I have a warrant. We're looking for drugs at in your vehicle, on these premises, what have you. And they're going to do their, their search. Um, using physical force is only warranted if individuals verbally decline and they try to you know, maybe slam the door in your face, okay? Deadly force is warranted when the officer's life is threatened. So now if someone flips out when they see the warrant and they get really angry and they start grabbing the police officer, why are you doing this? This isn't right. Okay, that's when the police officer is allowed to use deadly force. Obviously, they never want to use deadly force. Okay, that's not, they're not looking at to go out and kill people. Um, but, you know, if their life is in danger, they feel threatened, well, then it is warranted to use deadly force to protect themselves. Any seized uh, property, same thing with uh, chain of custody. There needs to be your seat to any search property, um, itemized, uh, cataloged, property described. Once again, starts the chain of custody. It must include the name of the court. Uh, dispensing any evidence, uh, so, it, you know, they're going to, you know, give this evidence to, uh, this evidence locker or this evidence collector. If evidence is retained by a police officer for the time being or evidence must be given directly to the court handling the case, depends on the situation, but it needs to be properly dispensed. 